doctors to give you more of anything, and uh, the doctor and the anesthesiologist says, well, I don't want to put you in there. So, <laughs> um, he did the best he could. I think he knocked me back out, <clears throat> and uh, then I came to you in, in the hospital bedroom, and uh, uh, it was still hurting like hell, but it was a lot more tolerable, I guess. Uh, there we go. First shock when you come to about how much pain you have is pretty bad, but uh, uh, when I came back to in the uh, 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 hospital bed, uh, I was doing a little better, but it's, I mean, it's still good like hell. Uh, they cut me 14 inches down my spine, and uh, east, uh, I guess my spine was all out of line, let me straighten the spine up, uh, and then he put the screws in and uh, did the fusion, so yeah, he worked my back over pretty good. Well, I'm glad that's better. When I came out of the surgery down there, I was hurting, and I said, can you give me a pain medicine? I said, this is really hurting. Because they did, you know, they wanted to do a spinal block thing on me, whatever they call that. And that, or they would put this medicine in my spine, and I told them not to do it. And that doctor, when he came in, he said, you didn't have a spinal block, you have nothing, and you don't want any pain medicine. I said, leave it be. I said, forget it. I said, I want to sleep. I said, I, and I, I want to know what I'm doing. You know, I don't want to be screw in the head. I said, I, I didn't know what I was doing before, you know, it was just terrible. I was trying to talk to that woman, trying to get her to, to help me get to the doctor, you know. And then when my doctor come in, she'd grab me my arm and take off with him. I'd say, I need to talk to you, and she'd just grab him by the arm and take off. And I told him after that we got through that, I said, that woman like kill me. And he said, yeah, I saw what happened. I'm, I'm sorry, you know. I said, well, I tried to tell you the first day, and I said she wouldn't, she took off with you. I said, every time I try to talk to you, I try to call him on the phone, she takes the phone away from me. I tried to call his office, I, I tried to do everything, she, he was just horrible. And yeah, I had stayed like that for a few more days. Good job on me, uh, of course, right now, I'm finally, I'm off all but, well, all but one. Uh, I'm off of the uh, high-power fentanyl, they've got me off of that. I had a hundred uh, microgram fentanyl patch on my arm, you know. Drug their uh, illegals are bringing across the border that's killing so many kids. Uh, uh, of course, they're they're taking pills that got milligrams of that stuff in there, and and that patch I had was in micrograms. Uh, you know, they gave you very little amounts of it. Uh, it's a hundred times more powerful than oxycodone. And then uh, they finally got me off the patch and uh, got off of the muscle relaxers, and I'm still taking the oxycodone, but only a couple times a day. Weeks, that's going to be the next thing to get off of. Uh, Todd, I'll talk to you later. I got a phone call here. I'll get back with you, okay? Okay, Jim, get your phone call. I'll have the radio on. KP0DD. Hope Wayne come in. And something I you.
Oh, well, on frequency and not listening. Oh, no. Oh, no. Well, okay. Turn your radio off then, OL. Yeah, hold on. Uh, something's not working. Hold on. Yeah, your signal's way down. Yeah, I got a zero beat in my radio. It's off a little bit. Yeah, is it off frequency? Because I think it might be. Sounds pretty close. What sucks about this radio is you can't zero beat it on the frequency without everybody hearing it. What radio is that? The uh, 751A. It hasn't been used in a long time, and it's got a calibrator knob at the top, and it, it doesn't have the extra resolution on the display, so you can actually be in between, you know, uh, a few hertz here and there, um, and you can turn the knob, and it will actually change the frequency, but the display won't indicate anything. You're talking about turning the calibration knob? Well, that too, and the fact that you can actually turn the VFO without the display changing, and the frequency will change. So if you just tune to 3853, you may not be on frequency. Right. Yeah, my 720 way back in the day um, had that feature. It only ran right out to the nearest, what, tenth of a hertz, I think. And so if you got a slack of plus or minus 100 cycles there. Anyway, hey guys, I got a question maybe you can answer. Um, I, I, I'm... Uh, in studio, I was in Studio B, and I was working with a, um, the, the 756 Pro 2, and I changed antenna tuners, so I, I put in a Palstar antenna tuner. It's a, it's a used one, but it works pretty good. And when I put the antenna tuner in instead of the other one, which was MFJ, my uh, AL600S, it, it kept on tripping out. It won't, it won't do power now. Every time I try to transmit it over uh, 150 watts, it trips out. And I thought, well, what's going on? Is it the uh, cable? I need to change the cable between the... I, w I was using the same cable. So uh, it doesn't make sense to me why it would trip out so much. suspect RF leakage of some kind. Absolutely. Leakage from a, a cable? Yeah, change out the jumper. You got something bleeding back in somewhere. So when, I, when I transmit at 100 watts, I trans, it transmits at 100 watts, it does fine. That's because it's not enough power to cause it to do that. The more power that you run, the more that that problem is uh, exacerbated. Yeah, well... I could change the cable. That was the next thing I was thinking of doing. I could I could run QRP and do a 10 to 1 SWR all day long probably, but if I try and do 100 watts, guess what will happen? Right. That's how they got away with making all those really crappy uh, walkie-talkies with terrible antennas. They didn't have enough power to really burn themselves up. But why was it working? Everything was the same before, uh, except the antenna tuner was different. I was the same ca cable. But, uh, but now, I don't know, maybe because when I moved the cable, that was enough to uh, make it uh, get wonky. Why, why, why? All we know is you have old jumpers and old coax, right? Why, why, why? Why? David, they'll be the, the coax guy will be at the ham fest. Oh, yeah, I hope so. Yeah, you're, you're going to be his best friend. Okay. Um... The PAL stars are very inefficient. At least that's what I've heard. I haven't owned one, but they're supposed to be very inefficient. But I cannot imagine an MFJ being better than a PAL star. But who knows? Okay, I'll, 
100 years old, brand new in the box. Oh, I got these cables. They're, they're pretty new, uh, Jerry. I got them in 1994. Oh, oh, my God. And he's not even kidding, either. Yeah, six, that's what, 30 years old? Just been sitting on the table. Well, and you wonder why when you unhooked it and hooked the other one up, everything took a shit. Well, it's because the cables are junk. <laughs> They disintegrated like dust when he moved them. Probably. Well, I could have opened up a shield on one of the connectors. Um, uh, do you have a way of monitoring the point at which the, uh, uh, whatever the overload uh, detector uh, looks at? In other words, can you look at the SWR at that point? Well, yeah, the SWR was flat at, Pal uh, at the Palstar. And uh, I was also measuring the SWR at the radio, and that was flat. Okay, so you can uh, at the radio, and that's where it uh, that's where it trips out, right? Or at the radio? Or is it at the uh, or is it at the uh, amplifier? It should be not at the amplifier, not at the radio. Oh, okay. Can you look at the uh, SWR on the meter at uh, where the um, SWR uh, is coming out of the ammo? Wait, isn't this the amplifier that you have problems with? No, I've had problems with the amplifier before because uh, it would, uh, if I would go over 300 watts, it would trip out anyway. Yeah, but, but uh, I was pretty reliably able to get 300 watts out of it. <laughs> yeah, that's the one that, this, that, that's the super sensitive, that ALS 600 is, uh, is super sensitive. Are you using the same antenna you use in the house? No. Oh, okay. Now we've opened up a can of here. This is the super, super old coax. Oh, no, that, that's the new coax. Uh, that's the new antenna I put up that, uh, that super duper G5 RV. You got an uh, antenna analyzer? Yes. Okay, and yeah, you need to put that on that and just kind of take a look at it and see, uh, you know, how close are you trying to match? You know, a G5 RV is going to be well over 3 to 1 probably on this band. Yeah, I, well, I, you know, you could bypass uh, on the antenna tuner. I bypassed on the antenna tuner just to see what it was. And it was about, uh, you know, 1.3 or 1.4 to 1. Uh, when I was going direct as opposed to, uh, to try to tune it. So I know that the G5RV, you know, it was uh, out of tune about 1.4 to 1. Oh, no, no, no. You, you, something's not reading right. You're not going to get a 1.4 to 1 SWR out of a G5RV. That's just not going to happen. On 20 meters, maybe, but um, if you're reading 1.4 SWR on a G5RV, your meter is not right. Why? Because you think it should be worse? Yeah, it will be. Uh, G5 RV is a 20 meter antenna that they, you know, popularized 
but it, it actually has all kinds of problems and the feed line radiates and everything by design. But I mean, like, yeah, you're not going to get the, a, a really nice match like that on a G5RV. Not without, like, manipulating the lengths and doing all sorts of really weird stuff. And then it wouldn't be a G5RV. I know maybe wrongly so that if you, if you were able to take uh, out the slack and get one-to-one -one SWR, that'd be good enough for the amp. But I know it, it isn't. But that, that was always my hope. I would imagine that a G5 RV full size on this band is going to be about 2.5 to 1 SWR in the best part of the band. That's not too bad. That's what it is. That is so bad, David, that most radios start folding back power at 1.7. No, but I mean, but if you have an antenna tuner, then you could take out the slack, right? Well, like take a 7300, for example. It, it won't even tune a 3 to 1 SWR. So if that antenna in its best spot is, you know, 2.5, and then you get up to the top of the band or the bottom of the band, you know, it's going to, you know, it, it's going to be way worse. But... When I had a G5 RV up here, it, it was not, uh, it wasn't flat or even acceptable to use on any band except for 20 without a tuner. And, um, but I mean, like, I'm not saying that they don't work. I'm not, I'm not trying to put down the antenna, but like, really, they kind of are a, a piss poor antenna. And they definitely uh, put RF into the shack, and that could be why your amp is, is messing up. You could have, you know, RF on the feed line. If you don't have any way of stopping the RF from going into the shack, it's going to go in there with a G5 RV. Okay. All right, well, that's enough. I, I, I guess tonight. Let me play around with it tomorrow. I, I was just going to mess around with that. I'll try tomorrow. Yeah, I have one question. Um, you said that it's an AL600. That's a uh, MFJ or... Uh, uh, amplifier is it, and, and it works fine with the MFJ antenna tuner, right? It was, yes. Yeah, so that's an Ameritron uh, MFJ ALS 600S solid state. Yeah, okay, but then uh, you tried to use a Palstar antenna tuner with your MFJ uh, uh, transfer. Uh, I see what the problem there is. We've got a mismatch in trademarks. <laughs> yeah, you got to send them some money. Okay. <laughs> but you could put the MFJ back in there, but I have a feeling you'll have the same problem. Well, I, I got to, the MFJ, is, the uh, knob is getting all messed up with the screw, so I got to take the screw, I took the screw out, and I got to go up to uh, True Value and get a new screw to put in there because uh, the, the knob keeps on slipping all the time, so that's why I did that. Oh, the set screw? Yes, the set screw. Is it stripped, or is it uh, is the Allen head stripped? Well, I was able to get it out with the Allen wrench, so does that mean it's stripped? No, uh, I was just asking if the, the, the Allen part of it was stripped. No, I could, you know, I, I could take it out with an Allen wrench. So, um, it doesn't slip on the Allen wrench itself? No. Well, then how come you don't just tighten it on the knob? I tried to tighten it as much as I could, and then when I was using the knob, it, uh, at one point, it, uh, it was like from one to three on uh, the setting. Every time I put it on three, it would slip down to one, even when it was tight. The plastic knob is cracked on the back side. You know, when you take it off, you'll look at it and you'll see it. But you don't think it's the screw, you think it's the knob? Yeah, just, uh, the knob is cracked, so you're tightening it down, and, and the knob is opening up on the shaft. It's not actually tightening on the shaft anymore. So what's the solution? You get a new knob? No, you need to take, it, take the knob off and turn it over upside down and look at it, and you'll see the crack in it probably. And uh, you have to probably uh, put some um, super glue or something in there and then put a little clamp on it and, and hold it tight until it, until it dries. Okay, all right, well, so I don't need a new screw is what you're saying. Okay, I got that. 
take the knob off and inspect it. This is like inspecting your antenna. You know, just you know, give, give it up and say, oh, this is broke. Now take the knob off, turn it upside down, look on the inside of it and see what's going on. If the Allen has uh, pushed on the, on the shaft hard enough, it might have broke the plastic knob and cracked it open. If not, then the Allen is, is, is stripped into in the, the knob itself and it's sliding in and out. So you need, you need to look at it closer and not just go get another Allen because that's not going to fix the problem. Okay, all right, thanks for that. And I don't think they would have that at true value anyway. That kind of screw? No, it's pretty small. Which uh, which tuner is it? Is it 989? Yes. They're not going to have that. Um, it, if you see a groove in the aluminum shaft when you remove the knob, then you can be sure that the Allen set screw is actually slipping. And in some rare instances, that does happen, and the knob's not cracked. And really, at that point, all you need to do is just sand the very end of the set screw. But usually, like what Terry said, is they crack. And so then it doesn't matter how tight you tighten it, you know. And then the other thing is the actual sleeve that's in the knob uh, will get stripped, um, you know, so you won't be able to tighten it. MFJ does sell new knobs, though. I don't remember how much they are, but they sell uh, a couple of different knobs uh, for that particular uh, one. Oh, okay. Because I found this out because the uh, the knob on some of the later 989s actually uh, almost matches the FT-102 knob, except for it's, like, really, really cheap. And so if you're, like, missing parts like the mask of the, the knob on the 102 because they come off all the time you just order an mfj and you take it apart and use those parts so i think they were like twenty dollars or something for a knob twenty dollars does that include shipping no that's extra you have to spend more than a hundred dollars just order eight knobs and you'll be okay Eight knobs, free shipping. No, seriously, David, just take the knob off and flip it over on its backside and, and look down in there. You, you'll probably see what's going on. I would recommend you just remove the knob and get like a, a small pair of ice grips and then just attach those on there and you're good to go. Oh my god. So that uh, Pro 2 that I used to have, I traded the guy and I asked him, is there anything wrong with this thing? Has anything weird been done to it? Oh no, no, it's perfect. I get it home and I notice that the RIT knob is kind of like off center. And I look down in there and I can see JB Weld and I, I pulled the knob off. He, he must have snapped the knob off and just gooped JB Weld in there and like it was like barely like even clearing the trim of the the, the, uh, the radio. It was like, how in the hell could you do that? Some people just don't care. K6 RWB. 87 OM. KG7 HR. I didn't ask him if he was the one that did it, but I'm pretty sure he did. The 7300. I might be off frequency a little bit too, but you guys sound normal. I've noticed I can kind of just turn the knob a hair. I like even when it have the tuning step with the button in where it goes, you know, one kilohertz. I can move it just a hair until you guys sound perfect.
can you believe that Alan paid fourteen hundred something dollars for this in nineteen eighty nine? Yeah, I mean it was the top of the line. That was a, a very popular radio. That was a lot of money in nineteen eighty nine. That's like four thousand dollars today. From uh, fourteen hundred dollars to sixty dollars, thirty years, right? Yeah. Well, the fact it still works says something too. It says a lot about the quality, doesn't it? You know, uh, Randy mentioned this. They um, they welded. The, there's a frame inside the radio. The metal part is actually welded together. Uh, where you know, in a lot of radios, it wouldn't be. Like the one, new ones in the, uh, the new radio. Yeah, I think the um, 761 and 781 were the last radios to have a metal face. Yeah, it said it was 76 here, so it, it was definitely warmer than we thought it was going to be. I was just talking this morning, uh, Bram, there was a big accident in front of Frontier Village yesterday. Did you hear about that? Uh, double. I said, I, the guys in, uh, in the morning said there was a big accident in front of Frontier Village yesterday. Somebody pooped their pants? I don't know. Uh, Rick said that they were doing CPR right in the middle of uh, Highway 69. They're trying to save the guy. That's never a good thing. When you get hit so hard that you're, you know, like, they're like, oh, he's not breathing. You're probably screwed. He, he said the guy didn't make it. I wouldn't think so, yeah. A lot of those guys are very well trained, you know what I mean? So, like, even if they... You know, and they get in that emotional state where, like, even if uh, um, somebody that was calm and, and collective would know the guy was dead, they, they still try and save him, you know? And uh, I appreciate it. But you said it was backed up for hours uh, right there in front of Frontier Village. Well, they, they got to do an official investigation when somebody dies like that, too. And, and here they kind of do a little bit more thorough job, I think, probably. Yeah, I don't really just drive around for fun anymore around here. In fact, I feel safer driving in Phoenix. You see why I don't like to drive to Prescott Valley, Terry? I keep on telling you all the crap that happens on the road. Oh, no! There's a lot of people that are really old out here that shouldn't be driving, and I think that's the number one uh, issue. You can see them. They're like, you know, you see them driving and you're like, holy hell. And, and, and some of them can't even see over the steering wheel. I was just going to say that. I'm like, oh my God, you should have never been driving even when you were 20. Well, I think a lot of these, quote, elderly people pass out at the wheel, you know, and, and that's the problem. Think of snooze? No, it could either be they're having a, an event. Or the medication is too strong and they go to sleep? I don't know. I just see these people driving all the time and they look like they're on death's bed. And I'm just like, man, please get off the road. Well, the thing is that this society is set up, at least around here, if you don't drive, what the hell? You can't do anything. You can't go shopping. You can't do anything. you imagine how bad it would be if we had a transit system here? Boy, we'd have so many homeless people here. Yes. That's why they're all down in Phoenix and not here. Oh, Terry, I read another article about a home invasion uh, and somebody defending themselves. I don't know if you read that one today in the paper. Oh, gosh, that was early today. So, uh, I've been working outside. I don't, I don't remember, but...
but it sounds familiar. I don't know, you, you re refresh my memory. She was an 85-year-old woman, and the guy broke into her house in the middle of the night while she was sleeping. Yeah, can you imagine that? And then the guy woke her up and brought her into the living room and tied her to a chair. No, I didn't hear that one, no. Anyway, this guy, I mean, this guy's, oh, what, what the hell, anybody does that to an 85-year-old woman? I mean, you know, he's out of his mind. So anyway, he goes through the house looking for uh, valuables, and uh, she's able to pick up the chair that he tied her to and carry the chair back into the room, and she had a gun under the pillow. She brings the gun back into the uh, room and then sits back on the chair, waits for the guy. The guy comes back, and then she pulls out the gun and shoots him. And as she's shooting him, he shoots her. And she, he shot her three or four times, but, he, but she shot him and killed him. And then, she, uh, this is, I don't know, this is a wild story. Then she laid on the floor, wounded for 10 hours, until the, her son came, and they called the police. They took her to the hospital, but she survived. Holy crap. Where was this at? I think it was in Pennsylvania or Philadelphia, something like that, Philadelphia. I'm not sure where. Some rural area outside of Philadelphia. I don't remember. But, I mean, how could an 85-year-old woman get all that together to do that? And, and all this happened in the middle of the night. Well, I'm impressed. Well, she's been, she's been well taught, you know? She knew what she was doing. Right, and, and they, they, they said, you know, it was justifiable homicide, obviously. But the guy was like 39 years old, and I thought, what an idiot, you know, to go in there and do that to an 85-year-old woman. I, I mean, I don't know. I don't have any sympathy for that guy at all. Well, he doesn't have to worry about it now. He's dead. As he should be. But if that would have happened down in Tucson, they would have said, oh, my God, we're going to lock her up. Yeah, but I'm just saying that if it would have happened in this state and it was some guy that, you know, crossed the border or something, oh, yeah, forget it. It would have been, she was in the wrong. Well, it sounds like he wasn't a very good shot. But probably not. I see, see, you might see the story if you go through it. I mean, it, it was all over the, uh, the Internet today. I mean, it was two different places. And, you know, it was like 85-year-old woman heroically saves her life uh, and rule justifiable homicide. I think Pennsylvania is kind of conservative, too. Yeah, he wouldn't have much of a chance in my house. Well, the fact that the guy got into the house and into her bedroom, you know, in the middle of the night, that's something, isn't it? Well, he wouldn't make, well, he'd make one foot in there, and he'd probably, he'd have a 357 in his head. I think that's how they want it. But, uh, getting back to uh, Bram, the Frontier Village, what is it about the Frontier Village? There's always so many accidents in front of there. I mean, you know, what, what is it about that little stretch there that makes it so dangerous? Um, I think it's because the people at that intersection, you know, don't want to yield. Where they try to turn into the Frontier Village? Yeah, yeah. And then they just get plowed. And those guys are coming down the hill and they can't really stop. I mean, there's been more people killed 
field in that you know, a quarter mile area than any other area I can think of in I'm 69. Well, just all of 69, you know, there's been so, so many accidents. And think about it, that intersection is kind of um, identical to the one at Home Depot over here, but yet they don't have any problem over here. Where's the Home Depot next to the Walmart? No, it's next to uh, like Ross and uh, uh, the new Cal Ranch store and uh, the burger place. What the hell is that place? Uh... What's the place that sells the famous Star Burger? Carl's Jr. Oh, okay. Talking about where the Dick Sports is and all that. Yeah, and that's a pretty busy intersection right there. And you got people coming down from the hill over there at that intersection, you know, from Home Depot, Dollar Tree area. But I've never seen any problems there. But that other one, I don't know what it is. And it doesn't even have the four-way. It's, it's got like... Uh, you know, but that whole section, there's multiple intersections near Frontier Village that are bad. From Lowe's up to McDonald's. Where's Frontier Village? Uh, you guys have me. Uh, I have no idea. You know where the uh, casino is, uh, Terry? Oh, Bucky's. Yeah, when, okay, if you're driving out of the casino and you turn left to go to Pesca Valley, it's the shopping center on the right hand side on 69. Harbor Freight. Okay. The Harbor Freight, uh, the movie theater, the drive in thing, whatever they call it, uh, Target, and then Home Depot. I swear everybody around here has to have a dog. We just got uh, new neighbors because my neighbor moved out and now his uncle is living there. Of course, they got some dog yapping away in the backyard now. You know, I mean, I don't understand. If you have a dog, why don't you take care of it? Why don't you spend time with it? Why throw it out in the backyard so all it does is bark all night long or all day long or whatever? It's ridiculous. That's what they do here. I don't know. And I got a guy across the street from me. He changes dogs every six months. We got these people that come up here, and there's always a select few. They bring their dogs up with them from the valley or wherever they live, and they stay overnight or the weekend or the week or whatever. And they put their dogs out on the porch or the, or the deck area or whatever, and all they do is bark all day and all night. It's like, what's the use of Why don't you spend time with your dog? I mean, I wouldn't do that. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's not like it's a guard dog or something. If you bring a, if you bring a dog up here in, in the forest, it's going to see squirrels, it's going to see all kinds of animals, it's going to see elk, deer, coyotes, it's going to see, you know, javelina, um, who knows what all, uh, on a bird or whatever, all day long, every day. So why sit the dog out on the deck when all it's going to do is bark all day long at all the animals out there? Well, why don't you spend time with your dog? I think a lot of people just get a dog because of it, but they don't really want to deal with the responsibility. Well, that's obvious. And those same people are raising children. Just like the dog, right? Absolutely. I, I heard them in the backyard, too. I'm like, I don't think they're being watched, either. My kids are not allowed to be in the backyard if there is not an adult in the backyard. No, and that's correct. And it's like the animal. I mean, the animal needs... If a dog is barking, you need to go find out why. You don't ignore it. You need to find out why. What's going on? You know, bring it in the house. Calm it down. Take care of the animal. He's, you know, he's, like, he's part of the family. He's like a, a, a child. You know, he doesn't know any better. Right, and if they're if they're barking in the backyard, you know something might be wrong. You know, maybe they're sick. Maybe you know something's going on. But these people don't even check usually. Like the guy across the street, he just leaves his dog outside, and his dog would get loose and come in the driveway here and growl at me. And I said something to him about it before, and, and he was like, "Oh, it's none of your business what my dog does." 
Mm. He lives in the backyard. I'm like, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, unfortunately, it's your business if he comes in your yard. And that's what I told him, and he said, oh, I've never seen that happen. But he's he's one of them guys from Mexico. You know, you, you can't rationalize with him, and he's drunk every time I see him anyway. Yeah, we usually go to 89A and, and go over there. Yeah, Payne, Payne Road. I like that road. That's a nice drive, usually. I mean, now you get people that are going really, really fast, so you just stay in the other lane and let them do what they want to do. Yep, exactly. i got to run down the hall. Gentlemen, KG6 or WB. All right, KG7 Trooper. Yeah, it's weird, Jim. They uh, they have like I don't know four lanes of road here, and it, it reminds me of living in Seattle. Yeah, um, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of weird. Um, I I remember it being just uh, super dense. Although uh, you know when I first drove it, it was just a uh, two lane blacktop through Prescott Valley. It's they widened it considerably, and I think they're trying to address the problem, but. Uh, I think the only uh, real solution is that, that uh, bypass so completely around the town. There's so many people here now. Um, we uh, She saw a picture somewhere in 1988 of what this town looked like. And the only thing was the Safeway and I, uh, one of the schools or something. I think it was at Liberty School. And it just looked like this dirt field with the Safeway in the middle of it. Oh, well, like, more specifically, like, uh, 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 South Everett, you know, Linwood area. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I worked at Boeing for about six or seven years there, and, um, uh, but mostly down uh, south, south end of town around, um, Burien, SeaTac, um, Kent, uh, Boeing Field, that place, uh, around in there. Yeah, I've lived all around there, Auburn, Algona, Federal Way, uh, Bellevue, Redmond, but a lot uh, in Everett and um, North Seattle. But uh, the other Boeing over there in Everett, you know, the traffic is, like they have their own freeway, <laughs> the Boeing freeway, and that thing gets backed up during shift changes. Um, but Evergreen, you know, 99, as you know, goes all the way from, like, I don't even know where, like, Arlington or something, all the way out to the south end of Seattle. Oh, yeah. As a matter of fact, that was kind of the main drag uh, in my neighborhood. Um, um, it just kind of went right past Seattle <coughs> and on down through Federal Way to Tacoma, actually. Yeah. I mean, we used to complain about having to drive to Tacoma, you know, and I think about it now, it's like, eh, it's an hour and a half if I want to go to Flagstaff, it's an hour and a half if I want to go to Phoenix. We actually really didn't have it that bad there when I think about it now, but the traffic is very similar in that area to here for some reason, and I don't understand because I go down to Phoenix and, like, the traffic is, like, it doesn't bother me. Of uh, the bounds here, 
and uh, go to some other place, well, uh, particularly go to even to LA, uh, but also over to West Texas or something. And I find everybody else is just slow and um, uh, it's just, uh, you know, and, uh, and doing all kinds of things that uh, would, would get them, you know, almost an instant fender bender, if not something more serious uh, here in West Phoenix. Oh, definitely. Yeah, and that was one thing that I hated so much about living in Washington was they just drive so damn slow. I mean, even when there was no traffic, they wouldn't even do the speed limit, let alone, you know, 10 over. Yeah, Seattle's kind of like Minnesota. They, uh, you know, there's Seattle nice, and uh, uh, they tend to uh, obey laws up there, even if uh, nobody's around, and... Um, and um, uh, be sticklers for doing it the right way and whatnot, um, and uh, you know also adhering blindly in a way to uh, to rules and regulations. I like that, <laughs> Seattle mice. I'm sure it, it's yeah, it's definitely a big part of it. You know, I, I liked living there. I liked all the things there was to do, and you know, being able to go to the the beach, being able to go to the ocean, being able to go up to the mountains and all that. But it's just. Uh, it got pretty wacky before we moved, you know, and when they started closing all the Walmarts down that used to be open 24 hours, there was needles all over the parking lots, and, you know, this is like 2015-16. I'm sure it's really bad now. Uh, yeah, I suppose, at least in some places, but, um, yeah, if you, um, I'm sure that, uh, you know, we, uh, we're well aware of what has been going on in Portland, and I imagine there's a, a downtown Seattle version of that um, to a certain extent, one way or the other. But it's been quite a few years since I've been back there, and, and it was just mostly me um, staying with friends out on the Hood Canal and up in Bellingham, so I, I just kind of looped through the town, looked at my old haunts, and then kept on going. When I was there, it was like 1972 to 1979, thereabouts. Um, um, it was okay. I was uh, pretty tied up at Boeing at the time, so really didn't get out and get, do nearly as much exploring and um, participating in the local uh, area that I thought I would when I took the, uh, took the job up there. but. It was okay. It was a it was a nice gig, um, but you know, eventually the web being feet and the web the web feet uh, thing started getting to me, and um, you know, I started um, uh, finding myself uh, adapting to the rainfall in uh, unusual ways. Yeah, it is very depressing, and you know, it's most of the year too. I really do like Bellingham. Uh, Bellingham's pretty cool. I actually grew up in Skagit County, which is a little bit closer. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I was born in Mount Vernon. So we lived in Marble Mount and then Rockport and then Burlington. And then I lived in Bellingham for a little while, too. Yeah, that is a, a nice town. Um, my friend who, I guess, retired there, uh, I visited her a number of well, uh, on two occasions, and um, uh, she lived down south, uh, south of the uh, town itself in a place called Sudden Valley, and um, it was just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, she had a deer wallow right next to her house, so you look out the bedroom window and you see the, uh, a couple of deer taking it easy um, next door in, in the woods. <laughs> so... Um, but yeah, uh, interestingly enough, uh, so you're a native up there, huh? Yeah, yeah, I was born in Mount Vernon. No, I, I lived there most of my life until I, I moved to uh, I moved to Oregon, I think, in like 2012 or 13. And then I moved to California for a little while. And then I moved here, and then I moved back up there, and then we moved here. Oh, um, well, I was doing automotive work, but I'm not working right now, so, um, but none of that had to do with anything to do with work. I was just kind of wandering, trying to get sober and, uh, figure out who the hell I was. Oh, okay. Well, that was another aspect about, um, 
uh, living up there is that um, uh, for me, I was found myself becoming kind of an aerospace gypsy. Um, uh, I'm just wondering if, you know, if, this, if the bottom drops out of this contract, uh, am I going to find myself on the road back to L.A. or uh, over to Wichita, Kansas, or God knows where, um, Elko, Nevada, I don't know, but uh, so um, <laughs> Phoenix seemed a little bit more stable and also obviously drier. Hello, everybody. It's Cliff from Sun City. This is Cliff from Sun City. How, how do my mic sound? Oh, you sound pretty good, Cliff. You got a good signal tonight. How are you doing at Sun City? Oh, great. Just fantastic. Yeah, got to get the uh, pipes working there. Your 7300 sounds great tonight, Cliff. Oh, it sounds fantastic, does it? Yeah. This is a great radio. Yeah. I've had this for quite a while now. I got my NFED antenna. I thought it was a G5RV. No, I've upgraded to the uh, the NFED. Uh, I hope it's a random NFED and not half wave. I paid $400, $400 for it. It's a Buckmaster. Yeah, Buckmaster. It's a Buckmaster. What's the other company that makes a really expensive one? Chameleon, and you can only put 50 watts into it. Or it's an Alpha Delta. Oh, yeah. And it came with a free crappy antenna switch. Yeah. I bet it's like 85 degrees over there right now, huh? Uh, it was 90 today. Uh, let me look here. It says it is... Uh, I can't get my phone open. Ah, I hate that. Just open the stupid phone. Um, it is 83. I'm 84 on my back porch this afternoon. Yeah, actually, that's, that's what I got, yeah. 93 or 94 when, when I got home in the afternoon, yep. Could you imagine that temperature in Washington? Cool. It'll be 100 tomorrow, David. You serious? Yeah. It's going to be a record, uh, the first 100 in uh, April? I don't know. That's what they said. You know, I'll, I'll let you know if it happens. But yeah, I'm gonna have to switch to shorts. I was dying today. Good evening, gentlemen. Hey, buddy. Everybody sounds great. Hey, Randy. Hello, uh, Tara. Hey, Randy. This is David. I know. I was gonna say, Dave. This is Cliff from Sun City. Oh, hi, Cliff from Sun City. Uh -huh. <laughs> that that's our uh, our our, our made-up uh, character. Uh, this is KG Seven HVR in Prescott Valley. Yeah, we need seventy-four at least. About seventy-four, maybe higher today up here. It's seventy-four degrees now outside my house. Clock was it hot by you? Ninety-four and eighty-three now. Wow, you're 10 degrees cold hotter than I am. Yeah, yeah, that's what the weather station said. Well, about five to 600 feet lower than you are. Yeah, I'm at 1,900 feet. 1,200. Yeah. 7,000. Yeah. How do you breathe and sleep up there, Terry? Very nice. Let's uh -huh. it up here. He's used to it already. I had a hard time when we first moved here. trip with my uh, father and we went up over the Rocky Mountains. I don't know, what is that, like 10,000 feet or something? Man, I, I, I couldn't breathe. Yeah, I, I just couldn't wait to get back down. I felt like I quit smoking cigarettes, you know, like it was just like I was always out of breath. Did you guys hear about the wig going into the uh, airplane today? What? Yeah, it was, I think it was Delta. But I, I'm not sure, but it, yeah, it's been all over the news. Um, we got some video of it. It's pretty funny. Uh, a lady was walking along. She was part of the ground crew under the plane, and uh, she walked by, and the in the air ventilation system in the plane sucked the wig off of her head. It went way up into the inner workings of the plane. They had to get a whole crew out there to get it out. <laughs> Delayed the flight for hours. I want my wig. 
couldn't take off with it in there. You know, it was jamming. A, <laughs> there's some kind of vent on the side where it where it intakes air. And uh, yep, she walked by and it, it took it right off her head. Right out of America's Funniest Home Video type of thing. Yep. She's running around completely, totally bald, embarrassed. Well, that's too bad, really. Yeah, I know. You're sitting there ready to go. You're like, oh, man. I'm finally on the flight. You know, everybody has, has, has dealt with that, you know. You finally get into your seat. You know, you got the seat belt on. And you're like, okay, I could just sit back now because there's nothing I can do. I'm on this thing for five hours. And then all of a sudden you're on it for uh, two two more before you leave. Well, that's, that's like uh, being in, uh, and Nate, Nate will tell you the story uh, someday, but uh, being in Wisconsin and leaving after deer hunting and we're trying to get out in the tarmac and it took us two hours while they were de-icing de the plane. And man, I was pissed. Everybody was pissed on that plane. We got stuck in Newark, Newark Airport for nine hours once. Uh, we actually rushed to get there because we were worried about um, not being able to make the flight. And uh, um, something was wrong with the plane. They couldn't take it. They had the guys in there working on it. I don't remember what it was. It was like something with the avionics. You know, they, they told us. Uh, but yeah, hour after hour after hour, and finally the crew left. And I, I turned to her and said, well, we're not getting out of here. There's no crew. But yeah, nine hours later, we left. Mm-hmm.